Good morning, everybody. My name's Jeff Wade, and I'm the Petroleum Community Manager here at Esri in Redlands, California. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this first dedicated Rocky Mountain Region Petroleum User Group webinar regarding improving workflows with mobile apps. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted in the next few days. As a participant, you'll receive a follow-up email with a link to that recording. I'm confident that many of you will have attended ESRI and other GoToMeeting webinars in the past. We'll follow normal practice and encourage you to enter questions as we go along using the GoToWebinar question dialog box during the presentation. We'll answer as many of those questions as time permits towards the end of the session. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to John Farrell, who will join us today from Jonah Energy. John is sitting in his office in Denver, and he's, the founding me he's one of the founding members of the Rocky Mountain Pug chapter. Good morning, John. Good morning, Jeff. Thank you very much. My name is John Farrell, and I am uh, one of the founding members and, and uh, still a supporting member of the Rocky Mountain Petroleum GIS user group here in Denver, uh, known as the Rocky Pug. We are a volunteer organization supporting oil, the oil and gas GIS community in the Rockies, and we have a very devoted and enthusiastic and, and highly technically proficient set of GIS professionals here in Denver that work in oil and gas, which is great because oil and gas is well suited for GIS. This group was put together this year in 2016, and we um, Intent, intent to advance the use of GIS technologies with oil and gas operators, ESRI, and their partners. Uh, we conduct quarterly meetings, and we intend to conduct webinars just like this one. Thanks, John. Um, my name is Jeff Shaner, and I'm a product manager within ESRI's development group uh, out of Redlands, California. And in the next section of this presentation, I'd like to spend the, the, roughly the next 30 minutes going over uh, Esri's strategy for, for building mobile applications, uh, applications that are designed for use in the field. But I wanted to start by uh, highlighting what we're doing in our applications group at, in Esri as a whole. Um, what we're doing is really focusing on extending the reach of the ArcGIS platform uh, to all facets of the ways that you use um, uh, apps that, that take advantage of location. That could be apps in the field, which we're going to focus on today, but also apps that you use day-to-day uh, -day in the office or apps that um, you can engage with the community on uh, to build purposeful uh, content and, and get re re you know, responses back, back from the community uh, through uh, crowdsourcing. Um, approaches. But let's focus in on um, ArcGIS apps for field operations. And I wanted to talk through the life cycle of uh, the way that you work in the field first and foremost because it really shapes the way that uh, we are building mobile applications that uh, fit into our application strategy. Uh, and that starts in the office and it starts with planning the field work that you do. Um, that could be coordination with third-party work management systems. That could be using our desktop technology to um, optimize the way that you coordinate and um, assign work to the field. And we've been building mobile applications uh, to help you um, in that process. The, the second phase of uh, field operations work is really how you uh, coordinate uh, and uh, between uh, the office in the field, and also with one another in the field. And we'll get into that in a little bit more detail as well. Uh, a third aspect of the field operations are how you navigate to the work that you do, and be able to do that um, in a very efficient and safe manner. Uh, when you get to the location of that work, being able to capture data in the field using mobile devices in improving not only the accuracy and currency of your spatial data, but um, providing a, a more efficient means for, for capturing data than 
that than uh, you do today with with uh, paper based workflows. And finally, uh, we have applications that we've been building that help you gain insight into those field operations so you can monitor the work that's being done, the the safety and location of your mobile workforce, and uh, gain insight as to the efficiency of all of that work. So we feel that, that using ArcGIS apps for the field, you can really improve the way that you're doing business uh, today. Let's start with the first product that's really designed around uh, planning your field work and the coordination aspects between the field and the office as well as uh, members working in the field. We introduced a new product called uh, Workforce for ArcGIS. A Workforce for ArcGIS was released in July of uh, this past year and uh, it really focuses in on uh, how you optimize and plan and assign work uh, to your mobile workforce. There is a, a web application that lives today inside of ArcGIS Online. It's called workforce.arcgis.com uh, and everyone who has an ArcGIS organizational subscription has access to it. There's no additional costing to it. Inside of that web application you can create what's called a workforce project and that a workforce project includes the type of work that needs to be accomplished in the field. It includes um, the list of mobile workers that are part of your organization that go out into the field and complete uh, the day-to-day -day activities, as well as integrations with the rest of our mobile applications like a Collector for ArcGIS, Survey123, and Navigator for ArcGIS. On the mobile side, Workforce for ArcGIS is an application that you can install onto uh, your device uh, and use it to view and complete work assignments. One way to think about it is it's very similar in nature to uh, your email client that you run on your mobile device. It gives you a list of that uh, work. It shows it into a preview that you could then tap on and get more detailed information about. Uh, you can organize that list in various ways. We'll optimize the fact that you have location and you could look at uh, that list based upon the distance you are away from work or whatnot. Um, when someone assigns you work uh, from the office, you'll receive notifications directly on the device. Uh, also important to the Workforce mobile application is that you can set your working status and that's effectively broadcasting uh, through your organization that uh, you're actively working uh, or that you're on a break or uh, that you're done work for the day. Uh, so those in the office can see uh, when you're working. It also um, starts to broadcast your location. So when you're actively working, uh, we'll log your last known location. And optionally with Workforce, you can uh, log where you've been. So you can get a breadcrumb trail of uh, where each mobile worker has gone throughout the day. Uh, the Workforce uh, mobile application has the ability for you to go through this life cycle of completing a work assignment. So the work that gets assigned to you, you can change to an in-progress state, uh, add and edit notes about the work that's being done. Uh, and then also there's an ability for the person who's dispatching that work to you to attach reference documents or photos. So it could be, let's take for example, a a PDF that describes the process in which you need to do an inspection of a certain type um, uh, at, a, at a facility or, or at a well pad. Um, so Workforce provides that context around the work that you actually complete uh, using other mobile applications. Now the status of uh, the Workforce product, uh, we released the first version into ArcGIS Online uh, back in July, that's the website, and also uh, the iOS application. We're in beta today with the Android and Windows 10 versions. Uh, we added localization support in October, so it's available in 
all of the languages that ArcGIS Online is available in today. And early next year, we'll be releasing the Android and Windows application and uh, integrating support for the website with Portal for ArcGIS as part of the ArcGIS Enterprise 10.5 release. So it'll be a downloadable, installable onto your portal um, web application that you can use to create those projects and, uh, and, and dispatch work to the mobile workforce. I should also mention that Workforce includes a set of uh, scripts that you can use to automate the process of uh, bringing in work or work orders or work assignments from third-party work management systems too. And we have a number of customers that have been using Workforce within ArcGIS Online to do just that. Things like uh, one-call reports along their, uh, their pipeline and whatnot. All right, so moving to the next application, uh, it's really focused on that need to get to the location of the work you need to do. And that's accomplished using the product called Navigator for ArcGIS. Navigator for ArcGIS is a pretty exciting application. We introduced it this year as well. And John's going to show you a little bit about what they've been doing with it later. Uh, Navigator uh, includes street map data. So we'll, when you purchase Navigator, because it is a, a premium application that's licensed uh, per named user within your organization, um, it includes street map data that uh, you can use for, uh, uh, for navigation uh, uh, across, uh, across land with a vehicle. But you can customize the map, and we're going to talk a little bit about that through a few slides. It works completely offline. It has that look and feel of a consumer navigation app, but what's really exciting about it is that it, it works completely offline, and it's fully integrated with all of the other uh, ArcGIS applications. We've released it on both the iOS App Store as well as uh, Google Play, so if you're using Android, it's available on a phone or a tablet form factor as well. Uh, and as I mentioned already, our, uh, Navigator works uh, completely offline. So uh, once you sign in to the Navigator application, the first step, if you're using ArcGIS Online, uh, is to download a map. And we provide maps in various uh, regions, uh, by, by states, uh, um, and there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of different maps we'll talk about uh, in a minute. You'll um, download that map to the device and then uh, use it completely offline. So if you're working in an area where there's no internet connectivity, uh, Navigator will provide uh, that full turn-by-turn -turn navigation and voice guidance along that street map um, for you. Now if you're using Portal for ArcGIS, you can, as the uh, uh, GIS manager, download uh, the maps from the MyEsri portal uh, and install them into your own uh, portal for ArcGIS instance uh, and uh, then your Navigator users can, just like you would do with ArcGIS Online, download those maps directly to the device. So that's how you can work with maps offline inside of Navigator. Uh, as I mentioned, Navigator includes street map premium data. We have coverage for all of North America and Europe uh, today. Uh, and it's at different scales, like I mentioned already, by country, by region, or state or province, or whatnot. Um, it's all also available with, uh, with content for the Middle East and Africa. And we're rolling out right now support for Asia Pacific with um, Latin America to be uh, completed in, uh, early in, in next year. And we update this data uh, quarterly, if you're, if you're uh, interested in that. Um, Within Navigator, if you have a map that you've downloaded, uh, you can um, be a recognize, you'll recognize that a new version of the map is available, and you can just download that new map uh, directly. But what really makes Navigator exciting is uh, that you can customize the map uh, because uh, you're, in, you're in control of it. So, uh, one of the things you could do would be to, to modify the cartography. You could actually add your own asset layers directly on top of the map 
so you can visualize um, uh, that information in the, in the map that you're using for, for navigation purposes. If you want to search against it, you can add uh, locators, uh, build composite locators with our, uh, with our locator. Um, so you could search for uh, you know, a specific well by its ID if you'd like. Uh, you can customize the network itself, uh, things like the travel mode. So uh, today we have uh, three different travel modes. You could introduce your own travel mode or customize the existing ones that are there. Um, you can replace the network with your own. So uh, if you want, you could build your own transportation network using network analyst, uh, your own map, uh, package it and, and deploy it. Or uh, you could take our street map premium data uh, with an additional licensing to get a file geodatabase version of it and pour your own custom roads directly into it. Use network analysts to build the, uh, the transportation network, package it and deploy it. You can clip maps to an area of interest and then of course share those maps uh, throughout your organization so that you can um, download them to the Navigator device. How that process looks? Well, you start by authoring the map uh, inside of ArcGIS Pro. Uh, and if you've gone down the path of customizing the street data, we'll provide you with a pro project and all the cartography that's part of what you see in Navigator today. Uh, as well as the file geodatabase with a custom street uh, layer inside of it that's empty where you can put your roads into or digitize them on top of uh, aerial photographs, uh, photos or, or whatnot. Um, and uh, once you've got that network defined and built, uh, there's geoprocessing tools that you can use to package the map and share it within your organization. Or you could simply uh, sideload it or copy it over to your mobile device if you'd like um, to do that directly as well. What's coming next for Navigator? Uh, well, really we're focused next on how you can um, pre-plan a route that can be used in the Navigator application using ArcGIS Pro, uh, using the, the viewing capability inside of ArcGIS Server, or ArcGIS Online, or the Web App Builder. Uh, save that as a route layer inside of ArcGIS Online or Portal and then share it uh, to Navigator so that um, the, uh, the device is always following along a well-defined uh, pre-planned route uh, rather than uh, determining a route um, within the Navigator application. All right, so moving on from navigation, now that you've gotten to the location of the work that you need to do, we have two applications that are really designed for uh, data collection or data capture in the field. The first one I wanted to talk about is a Collector for ArcGIS. Collector is a map-centric field data collection app that uh, lets you capture point line area features. It embraces fully the concept we have of the web map inside of uh, the ArcGIS platform. So the layers that are within it, the feature layers within it, become the data types that you collect data against. So you spend that time uh, authoring an effective map inside of our desktop software or inside of the ArcGIS viewer that's a part of a portal in ArcGIS Online. It comes to life inside of the collector application. And it directly integrates with your enterprise GIS. So if you build a, a data model inside of a multi-user enterprise geodatabase uh, that even supports a, a version transaction model, you could edit directly against that uh, in the field using Collector. Something else we'll talk about in a minute that's um, really important uh, is the ability to capture data using GPS. And we've done a lot of work in this past release of collector to integrate uh, with external GNSS receivers uh, and provide the ability for you to attach accuracy to the features you collect so that now you actually have this accountability uh, from a spatial accuracy perspective of the data that's stored inside of your system. Collector is supported on Apple's platform, on uh, 
Google's platform, and also on the Windows 10 platform. Something I wanted to mention about Collector is that uh, inside of both ArcGIS Online and, and the on-premises portal, uh, we have this concept of hosted feature layer templates. Uh, and I wanted to point this out because we have over 60 different templates uh, inside of um, ArcGIS Online and the portal today. And they, uh, they have a wide range of, of different use types, anything from health and safety, like uh, if you're doing offshore work, uh, there's a boom placement, there's um, there's a damage assessment template, and, and so on. These templates help you to quickly get up and running with a map for use with Collector. Uh, they're based upon what we're doing in the industry, uh, and uh, we're working with customers to to get their uh, data models and bring them to life inside of these, these templates. So, so back to the locational accuracy, as this was our focus for the last release of Collector, um, it's been a fairly um, significant uh, new development in the product. Uh, you can uh, use the location services API that's inherent to your smartphone um, device uh, and get locations, but uh, you don't get the true nature of uh, of the GPS position from that. So we've done some work to build our own uh, GPS parser that uh, we can use inside of Collector uh, a, a way to set a location provider where you can connect directly to one of those external receivers and receive purely the GPS uh, that streams to the device. And uh, if you're using a real-time correction like an RTK network or um, maybe it's a PPP uh, satellite-based network that's in its own local coordinate system, we've got a way for you inside of Collector now to do on-the-fly uh, datum transformations. And you can set that up uh, so that if your, if your positions coming in from the receiver are, let's say, um, in uh, NAT83, but your map is in um, Web Mercator, WGS84, you can define the, the, the transformation of the coordinates between them to make sure that you have the proper accuracy. And by adding some well-known uh, fields onto the feature class uh, that's used um, to capture data, we can uh, add all of the uh, GPS measurements, like the estimated horizontal accuracy, vertical accuracy, all the the dot measurements, uh, number of satellites, all that wonderful stuff. Uh, we'll also provide alerts uh, if you lose uh, that, you know, say the RTK fix or, um, or or you come outside of your accuracy constraints. So a lot of work was done around uh, locational accuracy and a few other uh, key features like um, integration with other apps and having a scheme for that so you could remotely control the collector app if you want. Um, supporting supporting um, location and direction information inside of photos, being able to zoom as tightly into the map and letting the, the base map pixelate if you'd like because your reference data um, is vector-based and, um, and you have a very tight resolution with a high accuracy GPS. So a bunch of work has gone into 10.4. Um, what's coming next for Collector? We have another update that's planned um, this year. It'll be a quality and performance uh, improvement update. Also adding app integration with the release of um, Navigator on the Android platform and, and the pending release of Workforce as well on that platform. Um, next year we've got a, a couple of releases that we're focused on. Uh, all the items inside of it right now we're, we're defining and they're under consideration. Uh, being able to average GPS positions when you're doing data collection work is one of them. Uh, simple uh, changes like renaming of photos or base maps and, and various other improvements. What's really important for us in 2017 with Collector is to be able to update um, and modernize the application based upon a new framework uh, that's underneath it. Uh, that supports um, vector-based maps, vector tiles, um, 
uh, labeling, uh, smart map rendering, uh, a lot of the new functionality that's being introduced in our, our underlying runtime SDKs. Moving on from uh, Collector, another application that we've uh, been working on for quite some time is Survey123 for, uh, for ArcGIS. Uh, and Survey123 takes a slightly different approach to field data capture. It's a form-centric data collection application that is really designed uh, to, to be that replacement for those um, survey forms or those uh, assessment forms that um, you do on paper today. And it takes a different approach for how you bring those forms to life than uh, most of our other applications do today. And I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so if you look at the forms that uh, you might be interested in uh, converting into, into a digital format for use on a mobile device today, they can be quite advanced. They could have um, skip logic within them. They could have multiple choice answers. Um, they could be quite long and need to be grouped into sections. And they might require um, signatures or integration with barcode scanners. Uh, Survey123 has that uh, capability within it. And the way that we, we bring that capability to life is that uh, Survey123 has a um, Survey123 Connect desktop application that integrates with a spreadsheet software like uh, Excel, for example, and embraces the XLS form standard. So you actually define your form using Excel and using the logic that's a part of the XLS form standard. And the, uh, the Connect application will provide a preview of what that form would look like and then actually publishes that form as a, a, what we call a feature service inside of Arches Online uh, or your portal uh, so that you can store that uh, information inside of the GIS. It's a fairly different approach than uh, what you would have today with Collector by defining a data model first and then publishing that uh, as a layer. It's available on um, Android, iOS, and Windows uh, as well. And uh, we've also been working on a browser version of it that's a part of Arceus Online today. So inside of Arceus Online, you could define a form that's used as a web form uh, on a mobile device as well. Uh, like I mentioned, there's uh, the Survey123 Connect app as well. And using either of those approaches, you can build the survey form, and you can share it, and there's a Survey123 website uh, that lets you uh, visualize all of the forms and also the uh, analytics about the data that's captured behind uh, those forms. Uh, and then you can use the uh, Survey123 mobile application uh, as a native application that can work offline or the browser version of it if you've authored from within uh, the website. So what's coming next with Survey123? Well, Survey123 releases every six weeks or so. Um, the next update uh, is really focused on public surveys. So if you want to share that survey uh, that you create with the community uh, and have them anonymously collect uh, uh, information for you, that's coming uh, up in December. Um, the website that we've talked about uh, is being built into ArcGIS Enterprise 10.5 as a standalone installer just like I, uh, I spoke about with Workforce. And then today what you can do with Survey123 is just collect new surveys. It's a, it turns into a point uh, feature uh, for each new survey, but it doesn't support editing an existing survey, uh, and that's coming next year. And the work on the, on the web uh, experience is going to grow uh, quite a bit. Okay, so now that you've got this process defined for planning, coordinating uh, your work, for getting to the location of it, for capturing that data, um, in the office you want to be able to monitor what's happening. And the operations dashboard for our GIS app is really suited well for that purpose. In fact, most of the deployments we see of our mobile applications are paired with the operations dashboard app for just that purpose. It's really designed around 
monitoring and managing your daily operations. Uh, we have seen integration where only in the office you might uh, want to integrate with your SCADA system. There's plugins directly with the OSISOS um, system, so you could look at uh, historical data around uh, you know your well performance or, or, or whatnot. Um, but quite often we see this coupling uh, with the mobile workforce uh, and you can visualize information that's changing in your real time and visualize it either through the map or through a set of widgets uh, that surround the map that are driven based upon the data that's within that map. Um, the dashboard includes a cross-platform extensibility framework uh, built with the JavaScript API, uh, so you could extend it. There's both a Windows application and a browser application today. The Windows application you download and you can use to author a view. Uh, in the browser, you can open up and visualize one. But we're working right now on building the next generation of that browser application, so you don't have to use a Windows app anymore. You'd be able to author, view, and manage everything inside of the browser. Uh, and greatly enhancing the layout and widget capabilities uh, so that you have a, an improved experience when using that view inside of your browser as well. There will be um, enhanced ways that you can configure widgets and filtering across a view, uh, new charting capabilities. All of that is coming. Uh, um, better maps. Uh, using the JavaScript API will support labeling and uh, vector tiles and uh, visualization of stream layers from geo event server, uh, all of the smart mapping rendering capabilities. Uh, it's available right now as a beta through our early adopter website, um, and we plan to release it in Q2 of 2017. And this is a really major update um, for, for the operations dashboard uh, and for monitoring your field work. The last application that I wanted to talk about briefly on is Explorer for ArcGIS. Today we've kind of positioned Explorer for ArcGIS as an application that fits well for uh, the executive in your organization that simply wants to visualize maps uh, and uh, their asset data on that map so they can get this awareness of where their operations are happening and, and some information about it. It includes things like a time player so you can go back and forward in time, support for presentations, and some basic sketching on top of the map that really presents the Explorer application as a tool that can be used for uh, briefing stakeholders so, uh, or for just discovery of information. But where we're headed with Explorer and what's coming next is we want to extend that reach to the uh, project manager that needs to go out into the field as well. So you'll be able to take uh, the maps, package them up uh, through an extension with ArcGIS Pro, and then uh, take them out to the field, tear them off, take them out to the field with uh, Explorer, and uh, support all of the new mapping capabilities that we've been talking about as well, with vector base maps and all the renders and map rotation and whatnot. Also uh, supporting map markup. So you can see through these screenshots where Maybe I want to use my finger and roughly uh, sketch a, a circle or a rectangle or what, or, or a, a polygon. Um, if it's a well-known shape like a circle or rectangle, Explorer will detect that and turn it into one for you, into a true graphics object that you could fill and move around. Uh, similarly with arrows and lines, uh, you could do the same. Uh, and then share that, store that, and share that as a new type of graphics layer that can be used to update the GIS. So no longer would the uh, red lines be on top of paper and live only in the, in the truck. It would be shareable so it could be updatable uh, in the GIS. And that's planned for a Q2 release with the beta uh, early this next year. So with that uh, update, I really want to pass over uh, control to, to John Farrell with, uh, with Jonah Energy so that he can talk about how they've been using Navigator for GIS and Collector uh, within their organization. John? Yeah, thank you very much, Jeff. I thought I'd begin by telling a little bit 
about Jonah Energy. We operate the Jonah Field, which is a, a gas field in Sublette County, Wyoming. And Jonah Energy is one of the largest privately held natural gas producers in the U.S. We have offices in Wyoming and Denver with our staff spread fairly evenly between those places. And we operate 4,600 wells. Um, I'm here in Denver today, and um, I was looking back at, at how Jonah Energy became involved in mobile technologies from, from Esri. And uh, to that end, I attended the Esri Developer Summit in Palm Springs a couple of years ago, uh, looking for solutions to potentially supplement or replace some of the systems that we were using for field data collection and vehicle navigation in, in Jonah Field. And there I met Jeff Shaner, and he shared with me some of the exciting developments that uh, Esri had underway in these areas. And I followed along with that with, with a little help from Jeff and his uh, very helpful and energetic staff. I uh, was able to embark on a couple of pilot programs with these technologies that um, I've um, been involved with this year. So when you look at the Jonah Field, which you see in this picture here, this shows one of our rigs, the, the terrain is, is very nondescript in the local area. I mean, you can usually see the mountains in the background, but for the immediate surroundings, you don't have many landmarks or, or ways to guide yourself on an extensive road network. So this is, this is a case where something like Navigator for ArcGIS can become very useful to people driving around the field. So of all those fantastic products that, that Jeff just previewed for us, um, the two that I've been working with this year are Navigator for ArcGIS and collector for ArcGIS. Um, so for, for Navigator for ArcGIS, uh, I, I started out, I just wanted to see how the product would work with different mobile devices that I had at my disposal. And I also wanted to compare what I saw there with the legacy uh, fleet of vehicle navigation devices that we use in the Jonah field that are that are standalone GPS receivers. Um, and I'll just call it Brand X. And it, it works quite well. But it doesn't offer the update flexibility that Navigator for ArcGIS has when you when you tie Navigator for ArcGIS to custom road network data that Jonah keeps on our GIS servers in Denver. So right now for the benefit of the audience, we get to take a trip to Wyoming in Sublette County and look at what it seems like to run Navigator for ArcGIS from a pickup truck. Let me uh, switch over to a video that will show this. All right, so the pickup truck right now that I was in is sitting at this well that's called 4926. And what I did is I had a camcorder, and I sat in the passenger seat, and a, a, a field, a field uh, reclamation specialist that was with me was nice enough to drive the truck at, at a typical speed while I recorded what it looked like out the windshield. And I also had a, a, a film loop of Navigator for ArcGIS running the same exact route. Um, in this case, I was using an iPhone for navigation in the field, but the actual inset video you see here of Navigator was recorded in the office. And it has a very nice feature where you can simulate a drive. And it syncs up quite nicely with what actually happens on the ground that you'll see when we, when we drive this short route. So we start off at this well and we start down the road. The well spacing in Jonah Field is very dense. And um, even though some of the wells are adjacent to one another, by line of sight, you have to drive a, a distance to be able to get to them. 
Uh, local places look similar in all directions. There's no trees. There's no landmarks. The field is quite large. Uh, it's 100 sections, 100 square miles. And each square mile is packed with wells. Nearby wells are slow to reach because the roads wander like you see here. Here we're making a left turn. And once again, this is our custom road network. These roads are not in StreetMap Premium with the ex exception of one main road. This road here is a main thoroughfare through the Jonah field. This is in StreetMap Premium, but all the other ones are not. And Jonah Energy went to a great deal of effort to uh, assemble a road network in GIS to support applications like this. It's very easy to get lost without vehicle navigation. There's 1,300 miles of roads, uh, and, and they rarely go straight north, south, or east, west. They go off in all directions like you see here. These roads were built to minimize surface disturbance and not facilitate visitors. There's not many signs. There's no shortcuts. You have to follow the roads. You can't drive around through the sagebrush. And the speed limits are kept low for safety. So we're completing our short trip here out to this well. We're passing a, a blowdown tank on the right. And then we turn here a little bit, and you can see the well. The well is actually inside a hut, and that's our destination. We come up on it. Navigator says we're there, and the pickup truck says we're there. So let me go back to the slide presentation. This video clip was assembled in 2015, uh, supported by Jeff Shaner and his people at Esri. They did some of the work on their site in Redlands because the product was still in pre-release. And uh, I didn't have all the tools necessary to assemble the um, what's called an MMPK file that's used for the, the package on the iPhone. So they helped me with that. But I, I did furnish them our road network. And the MMPK was assembled. And then I tested this throughout the Jonah field. When I tested it, I was using my iPhone. I was using the cellular network to get position. And I tested it in several different places. It worked great, given the inherent accuracy of the iPhone in the Jonah field, where um, there's pretty spotty cell phone coverage. But it worked just fine out there. And even though I narrated this video for you, um, Navigator provides outstanding audible turn-by-turn -turn directions. So you can essentially sit behind the wheel of a pickup truck and drive around and not be distracted by having to control the, the iPhone or whatever device you happen to be using for vehicle navigation. I intend to use this to supplement the dedicated vehicle navigation devices. Some people would prefer just to have one piece of equipment in their, in their truck rather than several, which can happen if you have a cell phone and you have a vehicle navigation device and you might have a rugged PC. We're trying to reduce the number of objects in the pickup truck to, to keep the clutter down. So then I turned my attention to the GPS data collection. Now at Jonah Energy, we have a fairly, fairly active GPS surveying program that uses a variety of GPS receivers um, for high accuracy surveying and some low accuracy surveying. And these are all earlier technologies other than collector for ArcGIS, technologies like ArcGIS for mobile and Trimble, TerraSync, things like that. And they have their place. But there's an easier way to get the data from a GPS survey back to your GPS servers for your enterprise GIS. And that comes with collector for ArcGIS. It takes out a lot of the manual steps that uh, we would normally use for some of the other uh, systems that we field for this. Now granted, those, those systems, some of them will still have a place, but definitely we can replace a lot of them or supplement their use using Collector ArcGIS. And Collector seems to be getting better and better, so I, I, I have a lot of um, anticipation for the potential of that particular product. Right away I can see that we could use it for surveys for blowdown tank batteries, one of those you saw in the video. Uh, cathodic protection facility surveys, qualitative reclamation surveys, and uh, surveying surface disturbance boundaries. 
Now, for, for my pilot test, I chose the qualitative reclamation survey, which involves going to the field with a tablet computer and then um, examining the vegetation growth of places that we've reclaimed and reseeded. Before I did that, I wanted to get a handle on how accurate the system was. So I took, I took the system, and when I say system, I had a couple of different mobile devices to use. I'll show you in a minute. I had a Windows 10 tablet, and I had an iPad. So I, I took those out to uh, a survey control monument in the field of a known location. I know the coordinates uh, of that monument very accurately, and then I could use the devices with a Bluetooth GNSS GPS receiver, and I could measure how accurate the, the readings were. And, and this is important because I want to make sure I pair the technology with the correct use case. And I haven't completely finished my evaluation yet, but the results are very good so far in terms of accuracy. And I have complete confidence that they'll be able to cover these four use cases and more. So to accomplish this, I had to do a lot of preparation on the server side. When you use a system like Collector for ArcGIS, a lot of it involves getting things ready on the server, making sure your software installations and uh, versions and data sets are all ready to go long before you even plan a survey. So for Joan Energy, I um, initially I used um, uh, ArcGIS on, uh, I used, okay, we have ArcGIS for server, so I had feature classes in ArcGIS SDE. I uh, published some of that in ArcGIS online, and I used that and tried that out with Collector, and then I followed that up with getting Portal for ArcGIS installed and configured, and that works very well with, with Collector and gives you a lot more flexibility as far as syncing back your data to the servers. So with that, I was able to achieve offline collection and online synchronization. I tested using an iPad and a Windows 10 Panasonic TuffPad tablet, and I measured the accuracies using the uh, Bad Elf GNSS Surveyor GPS receiver. So this photograph here shows you what the uh, survey control monument looked like where I was at. And you can see there, you see a Panasonic tough pad on the upper right corner, and then you see the iPad on the lower left corner. And then the yellow object is the Bad Elf GNSS surveyor. So basically what I did was I um, set up my collector projects in the office when I was still on the corporate intranet. And then I drove out to this survey monument in the Jonah field and I stood back from it, and I activated the GPS receiver. And then what I would do is I would walk up to the survey control monument, and I would record information about the uh, SBAS accuracy that was reported on the, on the device. And then I would stand there for a given number of seconds, and then I would walk away. And I repeated this. I, I took dozens and dozens of measurements and tabulated them so I could see what the effects of my time on station and other circumstances might be on the use of the device. And then when I went back to the office later in the evening, I connected the tablets using the corporate Wi-Fi, and it synced right up, and the data got back into Arc SDE as a version feature class, and I synchronized that back to the, the base version, and there I had it. It simplified the process of collecting GIS data in the field for me dramatically. So it really made a believer out of me about the viability of using this type of workflow with this type of system. So after gaining that level of confidence, the next day I went out with the reclamation specialist, and with no prior training, I handed him each of these devices, and I said, go over there and try this and see what you, you can do. And he went out, and, and using a, a feature class, that's the same one that he uses on uh, legacy equipment that we use for this purpose, he was able to collect data with, with no training. He just asked me questions, and it was uh, amusing to watch him with, with that little Bad Elf GPS receiver dangling around his neck. So that pretty much occurred two weeks ago. So this is where I'm at. Now, now it comes to the point of trying to 
plan strategies for next year to actually put these systems into production. So that pretty much concludes what I have to say. I guess I, at this point I'd like to turn it back to Jeff. Thank you, John. That concludes the presentation that we had prepared, and that leaves us about 10 minutes for Q&A. So this is Jeff Wade again. I'm the Petroleum Community Manager at Esri here in Redlands, and I'll host the virtual Q&A for the rest of the scheduled hour. Uh, there have been a couple of questions answer, an, uh, entered, and this is a great time to enter a question into the dialog box. Even if we don't get to it in the next 10 minutes, we'll certainly take care to, to answer those afterwards in the follow-up emails. But there have been a couple of questions enter, uh, entered so far, so let's get going on those. Uh, first to Jeff, uh, you presented quite a bit of information on the various apps, and it, we were going pretty quickly. So where can attendees review some of the capabilities and release dates that you mentioned? Hey, Jeff. Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, there's a couple of ways that, that we can make that available. Uh, first of all, every product that we have has a documentation website. And uh, what we'll do after this uh, webinar is follow it up with uh, a list of those locations. Um, there's also community ways to ask questions through what's called GeoNet. Uh, so you can actually um, ask questions that uh, you know the community can answer or we on our development team also uh, troll those forums and, and can answer those questions for you. Um, the, the third thing I wanted to mention is that uh, a number of the applications where I talked about what's coming next, we have uh, either in beta today or are pending uh, starting a beta program. I'd really encourage you to join those beta programs because it's a way for us to interact directly with you and also for you to get a closer interaction with us and um, see where the product's headed and, and help us in, in shaping that direction. So uh, the beta programs we often announce um, through blog articles um, and the blog articles are referenced within the documentation websites as well, so you can get that information there. But uh, we'll uh, provide a list of where those um, current betas are, uh, so you can you can join them if you'd like. We'll actually post these Q and A's to the GNet site after this uh, uh, after this discussion. Uh, so, and everybody that attended will get that GNet discussion link uh, in a follow up email. So, that's a great reference. Uh, cool. So. As John just mentioned about the the GPS receiver, there is clearly some interest in, uh, John had an interest in checking the GPS accuracy. There's a question about a collector working with mapping grade Trimble devices such as the GO7. Uh, can you tell a little bit about that? I, I'm not sure whether that's a question best to Jeff or to John at this point. Yeah, John, I could take that if, unless you'd like to comment on it. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so um, what what John actually did was he used the um, the Bad Elf GNSS Surveyor um, uh, standalone GPS. So you can still see it in the picture here, um, and paired that by Bluetooth to his Windows 10 uh, tablet and also to an iPad. But for a lot of organizations, and this happened, I think, probably for John as well, as the uh, a lot of organizations were using or, or continue to use uh, like the Trimble G07 devices that are running the uh, the Windows Mobile or the Windows Embedded Handheld Operating System and Collector for ArcGIS. In fact, uh, all of the applications we talked about today do not run on that operating system. Uh, the the G07s are are very expensive devices, um, and they include this high accuracy GPS capability. Now, uh, we've received this question a few times. There actually is a way for you to take a Android device and uh, Bluetooth pair it to a Trimble G07. Uh, and uh, I call this the MacGyver approach, but essentially suck the locations out of a G07 uh, into collector um, on your Android uh, phone or tablet. 
It does require that your GEO7 be enabled for uh, NEMA output, which uh, you'll need to work with uh, Trimble to enable if, uh, if you don't have it enabled already. But it, it is possible to take advantage of those existing Trimbles and use the, the investments you've had in, in, in them uh, as, the, as the GPS location source. So it would just be a, a much bigger yellow device next to the, uh, the, the eye, well, to the, to the tablet than, uh, than what you see in this picture. Okay, so in the interest of time, I guess I'm going to move on to the next question. Hopefully that dealt with that one. Uh, and it's regarding the, uh, perhaps a little bit more about the integration. Um, Jeff, you mentioned that a couple of the apps integrate with other third parties. So there's a question about APIs and SDKs for the various applications that you mentioned. Do most of them have ways to integrate with other apps through APIs and SDKs? Uh, that's a, that's another great question. Um, thanks, Jeff. I think you know what we we didn't show this today, but um, I talked about this product called Workforce for ArcGIS, and Workforce has app integrations with uh, Navigator, Collector, uh, and Survey One Two Three. The way it does that isn't through um, an SDK, but using a a technique called a, a URI scheme. So you can remotely control um, the collector application uh, or the navigator application through that URI scheme. And we uh, provide for each of these products a GitHub repo that has um, examples of how to uh, use the URL scheme. So you could literally, um, with navigator for example, um, uh, remotely control it from a text message, if you'd like. You could send uh, a, a response through a text message that would um, start up the Navigator application, pass one or more locations to it, and automatically have it generate a route for you um, that optimizes uh, across multiple uh, destinations. That's just one example. Workforce itself does not have an API for that. Um, there is a way in the workforce project to alter the JSON to integrate with a third-party application like we do with Collector Navigator Survey123, but it currently doesn't have a way to be remotely controlled itself. If you have um, requests to do that, I'd, I'd really love to hear uh, more details on that. So I think now turning to, to John, uh, you got going with collector and navigator. There's a question about uh, having had this experience. What would your recommendation be to a good starting point for people if they're just getting going with these apps? Do you would you recommend a good starting point? Sure, Jeff. I think the best way to start is to envision what your use cases will be, and then try to pair that with whatever software and mobile devices you might have at hand. And it's pretty easy to get involved in it if you use ArcGIS Online to provision the devices. So then you can kind of get comfortable with, with the overall architecture of these systems, and you can very quickly find what the limitations are that you run up against that might lead you, as it did Jonah Energy, into trying to establish the necessary server configurations to support better integration with your corporate GIS data assets. Cool. You started with Collector. You think that's a good starting point? Seems to have worked well for you. Yeah, I did start with Collector because in, in the case of Collector, I was using earlier Esri technologies like uh, ArcGIS for mobile that I, I, I saw needed to have a migration path to um, more up-to-date products. So there was really a, a compelling reason to go that direction. And uh, it, it turned out that with help from Esri um, and, and, and studying the Esri documentation and just trying things out, I've been able to get it to the point where I can actually make a plan and put resources on it for, for my company 
to be able to proceed in, in 2017. All right, cool. All right, well, in the interest of time, we are up on our hour. So there are a couple of other questions about, Jeff, people are asking what's a whatnot, but uh, we'll, we'll leave that for another day. Uh, and also about the, I, I think even I could take this one, Navigator actually being a fully released product and so on now. But that'll all come out in the in the Q&A afterwards. So, so at this point, um, we'll uh, move to close this particular webinar. Uh, for everybody on the still on the call, uh, there will be a short survey that pops up right after the webinar ends. Uh, we greatly appreciate you your feedback by filling in that that short questionnaire. Thank you again for joining us today. This for this first dedicated Rocky Mountain Pug webinar. We hope you found it useful and informative. We'll send you an email with a link to the recording shortly. Thank you for today, and have a great rest of the day. Thanks very much. Bye for now.